Imagine you're a dairy farmer. Imagine one day you have to dig a trench and shoot every animal you possess. The first farmer to be hit on September the 20th, 1973, was Rick Halbert of Battle Creek with 2,000 acres and a prize-winning herd. There was just no explanation. It was as though some bolt of lightning had hit the farm and suddenly the animals decided that they weren't going to be cows any longer. Halbert immediately suspected his cattle feed, specially mixed for him by Farm Bureau, his local farm supply organization. After checking everything else without success, he began an experiment on some young calves. These dozen calves were fed only this feed for, we intended a period of a month, but after a couple of weeks they wouldn't eat it, so we began to feed them other things. And about six weeks into the experiment, these calves began to die. And over the period of the next two months, most of those calves, in fact, died. Halbert told the Michigan Department of Agriculture they weren't concerned, neither was the state university. So he spent six months and $5,000 commissioning independent research into his suspect feed. It was the eminent Wharf Institute laboratories in neighboring Wisconsin that finally gave him his biggest clue. The readout from a mass spectrograph machine showed a type of industrial chemical, bromine, in his feed. Halbert struck lucky a second time when he double-checked with a friendly U.S. government expert. I immediately called up the individual who happened to be George Fries and he said, well, it sounds like something I've used and, and something I've done some research work on. And he pulled out something from his files and he told me that it was made by Michigan Chemical. The mystery was solved. Michigan Chemical were the suppliers of the nutritional supplement Nutrimaster that should have been in Halbert's feed. By accident, they'd supplied Farm Bureau, the feed manufacturer, with Firemaster, PBB, a fireproofing chemical. The substances looked the same and the sacks were almost identical. Michigan, one of the most northerly states in the American Midwest, is largely agricultural. Once the consignment of Firemaster instead of Nutrimaster left Michigan Chemicals factory in mid-state and was shipped south to the Farm Bureau feed mill at Battle Creek, a major disaster was almost a certainty. When Halbert's detective work bore fruit in April 1974, he soon discovered that despite official assurances, he wasn't the only farmer with problems. Mr. Grover, one of the MDA veterinarians, told me that a farmer up near Coopersville had 
complain to the feed company and uh, he was having other problems and they found some lymphomas which is a leukemia like disease and basically the farmer was having financial problems so he uh, sent all his animals to market he essentially sold them all and the MDA people went to the market with him I and mean, went to the slaughter plant with him and inspected them and this farmer later told me that the livers were the size of wash tubs the size of what what he said the, some of the livers were the size of wash tubs as cows died and were ground down into more feed they poisoned further cattle horses cats chickens and even farmyard rats began to die on contaminated farms the farm families themselves drinking their own milk and eating their own meat and eggs began to be poisoned as well Tom Butler became so exhausted for no reason that he called the doctor. The doctor even said, uh, well, you're getting older. I complain about being lame and tired and so forth. And, and well, he says, you're getting older, you know, past 40. And so uh, you you got to have a reason for something, so you accept it. And then after a while, you think, well, what the heck, you know, that can't be it. And I got to thinking, a new guy is 65 years old that was working better than I was, so... Top of the life and that, and it's got to be something wrong here. Nobody had told Tom Butler about PBB, but he noticed his cattle's grotesque symptoms resembled those of himself and his family. Some of them had their toes turned, hooves turned up, you know, and, and well, that's like my fingernails did the same thing, so that's another thing why I was saying I had the same disease the cows had, because their, their hooves were turned up, my fingernails were turned up. I was any, it's a proper analogy, but that's what I was using. Though the butlers and their herd were poisoned in 1974, after PBB had been identified, they were never warned about the dangers of tainted feed and suffered in ignorance, like so many Michigan farmers, including their neighbors, Ron Thomas, his wife, and three children. Right now I'm 43. And I don't want to ever live to be 65 if I feel like that when I'm 43, I'll tell you, because I would never get around. And, but... You know, you, it, this thing come on so gradual that it just wasn't anything that just hit you overnight like that. I've had times when I thought I was going to die just from exhaustion and just doing my farm work. I mean, I wasn't doing anything else other than my normal farm work. And I said, you just don't get in a state like that overnight. When my and, fingers were doubled you know, right up. I'd get up in the morning, my fingers would be like this. It would take me about an hour to get... Get my fingers opened up, take them one at a time, and it was they were real painful. So I thought, well, I, I tried sleeping on my hands, keeping them straight. Well, they weren't doubled up in the morning, but they hurt more than if they had been doubled up. They were just terrible, and I'd get up in the night with George, and he was the baby, and I dropped him two or three times. Fortunately, it was always over his bed when I dropped him. But you dropped George, huh? Mm -hmm. They were ingesting the milk and the meat right along with us when they were growing up, and Georgie was nursing right through some of the heaviest time that uh, PBB was, we, we probably absorbed it in the animals. I wonder what if they say 15 to 20 years is going to tell the whole story, and I wonder what's going to happen to them in 15 or 20 years. We've lived out a good part of our life, and they're just starting. What will happen to people poisoned with PBB? Nobody really knows. And incredibly, the state of Michigan, in the three years since the disaster came to light, hasn't paid for one independent study to try and find out. It wasn't until November last year that a team of experts, financed by the government in Washington, was invited by the state of Michigan to look at possible public health damage in detail. The team comes from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and is headed by Dr. Irving Selikoff, who reported his preliminary findings in January. We now have some very good ideas about what the problems are and will turn out to be. Perhaps where individuals lived may not be the whole story. For example, one of the highest blood levels we've so far seen of PPB uh, was in a man who did not live on a quarantine farm but ate 21 eggs a week. So it may turn out to be that what you ate and thereby what you were exposed to will turn out to be the most important uh, problem. After his press conference, I spoke to Selikoff. We found unusual symptoms among farmers who lived on 
quarantine farms, farmers who lived on non-quarantine farms, people who didn't live on farms at all, but uh, ate food directly purchased from these farms, uh, people who uh, simply were sent to us by other physicians for examination, etc. In none of the groups that we examined uh, did we find a complete absence of problems. Do you think that the volume of research into the, the effects of PBB since the disaster has been adequate? Well, no, it hasn't been adequate, in part because we didn't appreciate the dimensions of the problem in terms of human health. Uh, in, that, in that way, it was almost certain not to be adequate. Hopefully, we'll catch up, but we'll never catch up in, in terms of prevention, except for future exposure. From the governor of Michigan, William Milliken, through the State Departments of Agriculture and Public Health, nobody grasped the size or potential of the disaster. A token study of 300 people led the Department of Public Health to conclude in March 1975 there has been no pattern of illness in the exposed individuals which can be attributed to PBB. No real difference has been found in the health status of those exposed and those not exposed. Another public health department study published in that same month reached the conclusion PBB thus far has not been shown to be the cause of any identifiable human ailments. For the next 18 months, the official point of view was endorsed by Milliken and repeated by Maurice Risen, state health director. Assertions of extensive human physical effects attributable to PBB contamination in food are clearly premature and unwarranted. Men like Dr. John Isbister, community health chief, emphasized on TV that there was no problem. I have utterly no concern about PBB as a problem in foodstuffs, which uh, my wife, buys in the supermarkets today. We have never at any time changed our food buying patterns in my home during this situation. Yet in 1976 it emerged during the course of unrelated studies that nursing mothers right across Michigan were by now breastfeeding traces of PVB to their children. Not until August was any serious study begun and then with the same reassurances. According to press reports Dr. Maurice Risen, state health director, emphasized there is no evidence to date that PBB in mother's milk causes babies to become ill. On the contrary, babies of such nursing mothers appear to be strong and healthy. The most recent studies have shattered this complacency. Yet at the very start of the disaster nearly three years ago, a University of Michigan scientist, Dr. Tom Corbett, had pleaded with Michigan state authorities to call in Selikoff, warning of possible human health damage but nobody listened. They knew that, that Halbert's herd and other farmers were having trouble with their animals back in the fall of 1973. And that these animals were sick and dying. Uh, they, they looked terrible. Some of them, their, their, their hair fell all, all fell out, or most of it fell out. Uh, calves were dying, or they, the animals would be stillborn, or the cows would uh, not even carry the, the calves to term. They would abort. Uh, they become emaciated, they just drop dead. Uh, just, they're obviously sick, and they're obviously dying in droves. And yet, the Michigan Department of Agriculture, since they could not diagnose the problem, allowed the continued sale of these animals and their products for human consumption. When uh, you don't have to be a doctor or a scientist, common sense dictates that you shouldn't eat anything from a sick animal, much less the animal itself. And so for a nine-month period, they allowed these sick and dying animals to go to market. And because of this decision, uh, most of the people in the state of Michigan now have measurable levels of PBB in their bodies. PBB, polybrominated by fennel, had already done its critical damage in the nine months between September 1973, when cows began dying, and May 1974, when the first official action was taken, not by the state of Michigan, but by the United States Food and Drug Administration based in Washington. Associate Director, Dr. Albert Colby. We were informed that uh, there were a variety of herds that were having health problems. And we uh, were informed that these health problems were detectable 
in some instances uh, much earlier in the, uh, the previous year. And uh, in short, we found that there were a fair number of herds involved, and of course the numbers of animals involved uh, ran well into the thousands. But during the process of, of trying to discover what it was that had been making the animals sick, you hadn't been called in at all? To the best of our knowledge, no. Why do you think you weren't called in earlier? I really um, can't say because I don't know. My impression, I guess, might be that uh, perhaps it was not appreciated at that time uh, the implications of what could happen if, in fact, the uh, substance uh, was a, a highly toxic one. I think they thought that perhaps they were dealing with a, a problem that, while acute to some animals, was perhaps of minor relevance to human health. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know that that is the case. From our calculations, farmers who consume food products derived from their own animals, and those animals having in some instances extraordinary high levels of brominated biphenyls, we've calculated that some individuals on farms may have been exposed to as much as 80 milligrams of brominated biphenyls each day. Simple mathematics leads you to the conclusion that many individuals on some of those contaminated farms likely were exposed to quantities of brominated biphenyl that almost boggle the imagination. And simply stated, I'm quite amazed that some of the health problems that have been identified or suspected so far in this point in time are considerably less than what I really expected to see. And I'm did Happy. you expect to see people dying? Yes, that? I did. Nine months after the poison left Michigan Chemical for the Battle Creek Mill, a quarantine was imposed to check its spread. Too late. It was everywhere. A PBB tolerance level was set for meat and eggs, supposedly safe for human consumption. A hit or miss exercise, since nobody knew how toxic PBB was. And farmers with animals showing PBB traces above one part per million were forbidden to move or sell them. They were sent for destruction. Soon, the 15-foot deep trench dug by Michigan authorities at Kalkaska in an upstate forest filled to overflowing. The pit was enlarged to 13 acres. Insurance companies paid the bill. To men like Rick Halbert, compensation was paid and they are now rebuilding their herds. But many farmers have received not one cent. And the dividing line between the two groups is the tolerance level, set to protect human health in 1974. For hundreds of farmers, the arbitrary tolerance level brought catastrophe as damaging as the original disaster. It divided herds into officially sick, high-level contamination, and officially healthy, low-level contamination. Many low-level farmers, however sick their animals might be, were treated with derision and abuse by the Michigan Department of Agriculture, who publicly labeled them as frauds. Because their animals were officially healthy, they were disqualified from any right to compensation from Michigan Chemical or Farm Bureau, and thus had an awful choice. Sell the sick animals quite legally, or shoot them and lose their livelihoods. With cows officially healthy, but sickening each day, Gary Zydeveen faced that choice. They just wouldn't grow. They were uh, terribly thin, and uh, in many cases, the, the hair was, had came off their backs, and uh, they had runny noses, and they had ulcerated eyes. They, had, they were just a mess. They were just a physical mess. Economically, they were impossible to care for and take care of. And yet, because they were l below the tolerance level, they were officially not sick, That's as it were. That's right. I mean... The How does that strike you as a farmer? It doesn't make any sense. What did you do in the event? Well... We, we shot our cattle. I mean, it hurts me to say this. I mean, it was an awful day. Uh, I'll never forget that day as long as I live. We had to... 
We dug a big hole about uh, oh, 250 feet long and about uh, 20, 30 feet wide, and we'd run the cattle in there uh, eight or ten to a time. And uh, my son and a neighbor boy stood on the side, and they destroyed the cattle. They were It was done painlessly. The cattle did not suffer. But it's a dark day in my life to have to shoot our own cattle. And I think the state agencies are wrong that they that they force a farmer to make that kind of a decision to destroy his own cattle is wrong. I mean, it's morally wrong to, to place that kind of a burden upon a, uh, a farmer. They should have been cared for by the, by the agencies. Uh, this way, is, it's terrible to do this. Tom Butler couldn't afford to shoot his animals. He sent them to market because the agriculture department, the MDA, pronounced them healthy even though they looked terrible. A lot of bloodshot eyes and... Uh, Cows had sores on them. Some of them had, uh, well, their pelvis had just de just degenerated and twisted and shifted right down. Their tail settings had kind of slid right off sideways, and uh, it looked like the thing a cow had been in a wreck, you know, but uh, they couldn't see nothing wrong with them. So the MDA said there was nothing wrong with the cows? Right. And What's uh, your view as a farmer? Well, of course, like anything, you get used to that after a while, but... Uh, it was just disgusting to us that uh, they didn't even try to find anything wrong with them. They didn't, they didn't want to find anything, and they didn't. We didn't feel right about it, but uh, all the authorities that were supposed to be uh, interested in this thing, uh, the governor all just didn't seem concerned whatsoever. So we had to do something, and we printed took them out and shot them. Different ones were doing that. And then we decided, we studied the situation over and says, well, shoot. We can probably get by a couple of years if we sell them, even at the reduced price you get for hamburger, you know. Uh, it'd help us to survive a couple of years without even uh, having any income. So we, with mixed emotion, shipped them to market. Tom Butler, his own health too damaged to farm, his cows gone, is now living off capital. Like many other low-level farmers, he's wondering about suing Michigan Chemical, who manufactured the poisonous farm master, and Farm Bureau who put it in his feed. One ally in the cause is Grand Rapids lawyer Gary Schenk, who is already acting for several high-level farmers. You see, we represented initially people who had herds that were quarantined and destroyed. That's the best of all possible worlds. That is an absolute winner in a lawsuit. They poison their cattle, they destroy them. We had people who kept calling us and saying, well, they tell me I'm a low-level herd, but my cows are dying, and they look like these other cows. And We didn't believe that at first, but we started looking. Low-level and therefore not liable for compensation. Not liable for compensation, but the Department of Agriculture did even more than that. They equated low-level with not being sick. At least that was the public image that they tried to convey. One state official stood right over here in our federal building and said that the low-level herds are not sick, they're being starved to death. Lifelong farmers starving their cattle to death. It was a measure of how far the Michigan Department of Agriculture would go to try and show that PBB wasn't the problem. So far, without going to court, most high-level farmers have been paid off with nearly $40 million by Farm Bureau and Michigan Chemical. But hundreds of low-level farmers, angry and near bankruptcy, have been forced to sue for anything at all. As their cows sickened, they were branded as frauds and told PBB was not to blame. And for nearly a year after PBB had been identified, upstate vets like Doc Clark were given the same runaround as their farmers. I was very depressed. Uh, I thought that something I was doing wrong, and I'd come home and talk to my wife about it, especially in July of 1974, and, and I said, oh, I wonder if I should quit. The cows wouldn't respond. We were treating them up to 42 times, and you don't normally treat a cow up to 42 times. You treat her three times. You, tr you treat her once, you leave medicine, and that's all you have to do. I would come home and talk to my wife and I'd say, I wonder if something's going wrong. I wonder why uh, I'm not getting the results. So 
as the time went on in, in July, I started to wonder about this feed situation, even though they had sent a letter out, and several of my clients' cows, best cows, were dying. Clark's farmers had been officially told that problem feed hadn't reached their area. A lie. But then Rick Halbert had been told a parallel lie, that he was the only farmer affected. They said that nothing was happening on other farms, there weren't another complaint specifically, because we'd ask, well, isn't someone else complaining that's getting feed? And the answer was no. Was anybody else getting the same feed formula as you, though? Yes, there were some people in the thumb of Michigan and, uh, and some others. In the thumb. I learned about those about four months later, but and I had learned that they had also complained. Halbert then found that no Michigan state organizations wanted to do any research into his problem. First, he took dead calves to Michigan State University in Lansing. We took them up to the university and asked them to necropsy them, which is a process of cutting them apart and looking at the organs. And the result of that was when they wrote up the, uh, the report, it said uh, died of starvation. And how did you react to that as a farmer? Well, we felt insulted, for one. It's one thing to say that they died of starvation, but uh, the problem was they wouldn't eat. And that's what we wanted to know, why they wouldn't eat. And so th their help was really no help, in fact. It was an insult. He then asked the Department of Agriculture's Dairy Division, also based on the university campus, to run an experiment using his calves, his feed, and his money. Their cozy relationship with Farm Bureau intervened. They didn't want to get involved in a squabble between a farmer and a feed company. Clearly, the Farm Bureau supports the university in some programs, provides grants and so on, and uh, maybe they felt it wasn't in their best political interest to be involved. As the disaster escalated through 1974, B. Dale Ball, director of Michigan Department of Agriculture, insisted to the press that he'd known nothing of the problem until March 1974, six months after Halbert had gone to his department for help. Ball's lieutenant, Dean Lovett, who had exclusive responsibility for animal feed, claimed the same ignorance until May 1974, nine months after the problem began. B. Dale Ball cast about for almost any explanation, as long as it wasn't PBB. Take this press release, for instance. Common table salt can be lethal if consumed in large amounts. It's not unusual for animals to die from salt poisoning. Ball's experts, like veterinary chief Dr. Cole, lectured worried farmers on irrelevancies, as Doc Clark recalls. In December of 1975, Dr. Cole was up here to a meeting trying, uh, trying to tell my dairy farmers that had low-level herds, instead of holding them or shooting them, that go to go ahead and dump them on the market because we uh, we weren't sure what was causing the problems and he made a statement that if you fed those cows too much pickles you might get the same problem as more and more high-level cattle died or were quarantined farm bureaus bill for damages and the agriculture department's workload grew daily then a startling new piece of research was published dr donald hillman a dairy nutritionist at the michigan state university delivered a weighty report claiming that excessive use of iodine could be to blame for the farmer's problems. Within three weeks, it had been dismissed as a travesty by other scientists. The scandal escalated when it emerged that Hillman's $25,000 budget had been paid by Farm Bureau. Dr. Duane Deming of the Department of Agriculture's Animal Health Division was assigned to appraise the legitimacy of the claims and clinically evaluate the symptoms observed in 72 PBB herds. Last November, it emerged that his salary during the study had been paid by Michigan Chemical Corporation. When Dr. Tom Corbett provided independent PBB research giving cause for human health concern at an early date, Farm Bureau were less than anxious that he should spread the news. After I presented my data, one of the officials from the Farm Bureau, unfortunately I cannot remember his name, uh, came up to me and virtually told me that they did not, or they would not allow me to present any of my data to the press or that any of this material should get out for public knowledge. And uh, I was quite surprised. In fact, I, I couldn't believe that this man was saying this to me, and I told him on no uncertain terms that 
uh, they did not sponsor the project, they had no claim on any of the information whatsoever, and that I would tell whoever I pleased. In fact, the more people I would tell I thought would be the better, because the people had a right to know what potentialists had for harming the population of the state. When Corbett approached the Department of Agriculture for research funds, there weren't any. I spoke with Dr. Whitehead several times uh, to determine uh, whether the Michigan Department of Agriculture had any funds available to support any research. I just asked him informally uh, over the telephone at one time. Uh, and also uh, uh, I spoke with him uh, regarding his knowledge on some of the studies of the toxicity of Firemaster. What was the impression you got from him about the attitude of the department and the availability my, of funds? My general impression, I, I was quite discouraged very early. Did they indicate any willingness to put up money or if they hadn't got any, apply for some from somewhere? Uh, no, I, I asked Dr. Whitehead at one point whether there were any uh, funds available for research and Firemaster and he said that they were a regulatory agency and not a funding agency and uh, so I let the matter drop. But it was Doc Clark who felt the full weight of the department's dirty tricks division. To double check official statements that contaminated feed hadn't reached his area, even though local animals were sick, he took body fat samples from no less than a thousand cows and sent them for PBB checking to the Department of Agriculture. The reports showed no serious levels. He was deeply suspicious. So what I did was go back and test 40 cows over again. Same, I went back and did the same process over again. Took fat samples alongside the tail, put it in, identified it, and froze them up. And this time, instead of sending them to uh, MDA, I sent them to Wharf Institute. And the first, the first ones I got back, I couldn't believe it. They were tenfold higher. The same cows. It was just as Clark suspected. Wharf Institute in Wisconsin, independent, eminent showed the Department of Agriculture had grossly underestimated PBB levels. Wolf asked Clark if they could forward copies of their results to the Agriculture Department. And I said, I didn't care. I thought if there was a mistake being made, they might as well know it too. And the moment, the moment that they seen that I uh, had found out that there was a difference, I was stopped alongside the road in a MDA official that was on sort of down on the mice level that of test uh, run, running around here and checking meat samples told me I think you're doing a terrific job but I want you to know the MDA is after your ass and that's exactly what he told me and I got back in my car and I wasn't very happy that a power of this large could try to come down on you so I decided that I better, I better keep on everything and keep things moving along and, and keep on checking. So with Agriculture Department permission, he shipped live local cattle south across the state line to Purdue University in Indiana for further testing. Before the results came through, he read in the local newspaper that he was on the point of arrest and losing his vet's license for shipping PBB cattle out of Michigan. The carefully leaked smear failed because Doc Clark's local farmers, already incensed at the agriculture department, read the story and called Gary Schenk. I got a call sitting in my office from a farmer, a person whom we represent. And he said, Gary, we're having a meeting at my house. I said, well, who's having a meeting? And he named the names, and there were about 15, 20 farmers there. And I said, well, what are you meeting about? And he said, well, we want you to answer a question, and we want it yes or no. He said, are, are they coming to get Doc? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, they, they said they're investigating him for being a criminal, for taking those cows to Purdue. I said, now, wait a minute. He said, I just want to tell you one thing. You call your friends, and you tell them if they're coming to get Doc, they better bring their guns because we're going to be waiting in front of his house with ours. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he said, we're all here, and we got our rifles, and we've just had it. Now, this is as close as we've ever come on this thing to violence. And I was scared. I called Paul, and I said, we've got to do something. And I called them back, and I said, don't anybody do anything. We'll come up and tell you what's going on. And we did. I mean, we took off for up there and, and had to get everybody calmed down because they thought that these guys were coming after their doctor. And uh, I'm going to tell you something, my friend. There ain't no way that that was going to happen because when a farmer starts talking, 
about his deer rifle. He means business. And, and you know, it, it, I think it's an example of, of what has happened to these people. You know, they, they've been laughed at, they've been lied to, they've been ridiculed, they've been called liars and phonies and fakes and cheats and frauds. You know, and they can put up with all that. But I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back when they were trying to take out the only man that had ever been interested enough to believe in him. At least the only man they knew. Doc Clark wasn't taken out. A telephone call from the Agriculture Department allowing him to send live animals for out-of-state research had fortunately been tape-recorded, and the attempt to discredit him failed. It's a sad reflection on the state agency that it should stoop to such skullduggery. But saddest of all is the fact that much of the important human health research into PBB now going on is being paid for not by the state of Michigan, whose public health slogan is equal health opportunity for all, nor by the people who made the poison, Michigan Chemical, nor Farm Bureau who distributed it, but by the low-level farmers who face ruin as a result of PBB. They are the people who have financed top biochemists like Dr. Stephen Safe of the University of Guelph outside Toronto. I didn't become directly involved until I was approached by some of the people in Michigan about nine months ago, I think. Uh, the, the people who approached you, I assume that that was the governor or Department of Agriculture? No, the lawyers for the low-level farmers. There have been no official, uh, official requests for you as somebody working in this area to go help and see what you could do? None at all. None at all. So far, Dr. Safe has traced PBB's path through animals' bodies, charted the chemical changes as their systems try to excrete it, and explored the effects of the traces that inevitably remain behind. His findings so far are preliminary, but frightening. What we've come up with essentially is a positive in a first stage cancer screen, a very low level cancer screen. It could cause cancer. That's right. It causes cancer or it can cause mutations, birth defects, things like that. Now, I'm not saying that PBB will do this, but in our first screen or stage uh, examination of PBB, it looks like it has the potential. For the nine million people in Michigan, what it amounts to is that they're going to add to their bodies another foreign chemical, another chemical that shouldn't be there. We all have these chemicals in us now. They've got another one that most of us don't have. They may or may not be affected. You'd have to do a general population study 10 or 15 years from now. But the farmers and the farm families, they have relatively large quantities of this material. And I think the results are already obvious. And what do you think the results are? Well, all I know is that uh, when Dr. Selikoff and his team came to Michigan, they looked at 1,100 people and about, what, 35% or so had abnormal uh, symptoms. They were suffering from something. And it looks like PBB is the culprit. That's a pretty large percentage. To Dr. Corbett, the predictions are no surprise. His own research on pregnant mice and rats dates back three years. We found that we did produce birth defects in, uh, in the mice. We found cleft palates in 5% of the babies and we found a condition called exencephaly in uh, a little over 2% of the animals. What exactly is that? Exencephaly is a defect uh, where the brain protrudes through the, the skull and uh, you can see it protruding through the top of the head grossly. It's a rather uh, grotesque deformity. Now what, uh, uh, what was the timing of this? When did you uh, conclude this? We found the first results uh, actually in late June of 1974. So your information was available to the authorities or anybody else interested at a fairly early date? Indeed. In fact, I, I made sure that they were aware of it uh, at two meetings, one in September of uh, 1974, which was held at the Farm Bureau building, attended by the regulatory agency members and scientists and other people. Uh, and again in October of 1974 at a meeting held by the Michigan Department of Agriculture. But nobody listened. Why not? I would prefer to, to think that it was just a combination of ignorance and stupidity. I, I think they had no 
uh, knowledge or conception of the potential harm that could come from these extremely toxic chemicals at, at such low doses. I think they felt uh, initially that, you know, how can one or two parts per million hurt anybody? I think this is sort of the attitude, just a complete ignorance of the toxicity of, of this whole class of chemicals. But I think overall, with 9 million people exposed to this chemical and about 10,000 exposed to fairly high doses, uh, I, I think it's quite likely that we will see an, in, an increase in the incidence of cancer in this state in the next 15 or 20 years. To provide further evidence, PBB in concentrations similar to those absorbed by some Michigan families is already being fed to apes, the closest animal to man, at the University of Wisconsin. The experiments, which involve regular fat sampling, began only recently, again with money from low-level farmers, because neither the state of Michigan nor the United States authorities have yet provided any cash for this kind of PBB research. The team is headed by Dr. James Allen. I think that the point that we are concerned about at the present time are the effect that it may have upon the future generations, whether this be uh, the possibility of teratogenic or mutagenic effects that may arise as a result of, of exposure to the deformed children, deformed children or alteration in the germplasm sufficiently to be transmitted from generation to generation, or the possibility of cancer. I think all of these. Are, are possibilities. What requests have you had from the, the Michigan uh, authorities to, uh, to help out in this whole matter? Uh, our request uh, from the Michigan authorities, uh, we have not been requested uh, to assist in this particular aspect. Uh, only from uh, private individuals have we been contacted about uh, the possibility of conducting research on the uh, PBBs. So where are the state and government agencies? Well, I think that certainly this is a problem that Michigan, that the people in Michigan uh, uh, should uh, be concerned. I think it's a problem that the federal government should be concerned about. And I think that uh, these two groups can get together and I'm sure establish a, a plan to really get at the problem uh, in a uh, very systematic manner. Let's hope this is, is taking place. Well, this, of course, is three years after the event now we're talking, isn't it? Sometimes things move slowly. So slowly, in fact, that in their fight for compensation, Doc Clark and his farmers are forced to keep alive appallingly damaged PBB cows as potential court evidence. I'm real sure if we could do a mass spec study of her liver, we'd find the things that we're talking about that come along with the Flyermaster compound. Because this is a typical physical degenerative cow. And on top of it, she's showing the chronic effects of the feed. But perhaps the saddest aspect of the tragedy is that it need never have happened at all. Did the poisoning of Michigan ever have happened? How and why did it take place? The answers lie here at St. Louis, Michigan, headquarters of Michigan Chemical Corporation, where this ramshackle factory pollutes the atmosphere, has killed all life for 35 miles downstream in the Pine River, but also offers most of the jobs in an area of 19% unemployment. Michigan Chemical's owners have changed its name, but the factory still operates under the original management. Now, as previously, it forms part of Velsicol Chemical Corporation, which in turn is controlled by Northwest Industries, a Chicago-based conglomerate that this year expects record profits on sales of $1.6 billion. 
Velsikov's recent record is notable for three things. High profits, the manufacture of Tris BP, a flame retardant used in children's nightclothes, now suspected of causing cancer, and the manufacture of Fosvel, a pesticide that's reduced workers handling it to zombies. Inside the St. Louis operation, conditions are just as bad as they look from the outside. Here, amid broken sacks, inadequate labeling and hit or miss stock checking, the bags of Firemaster containing PBB were confused with bags of Nutrimaster and sent to Farm Bureau's feed mill. So far, it's always been assumed that the PBB disaster involved only one ton of Nutrimaster, in place of which a ton of Firemaster had been sent. But this week has now discovered that in 1975, no less than 19 tons of Firemaster were missing and are still unaccounted for. Given the conditions inside Michigan Chemical, it's surprising that a major disaster did not occur long ago. For in addition to polluting the entire plant with frightening levels of PBB, the company for a long period stored PBB in sacks alongside chemical salts destined directly for the human food chain. There are still no regulations to prevent this, and although Firemaster is no longer made here, a chemically similar product is now being produced on the same line in the same way. Michigan Chemical refused to discuss their products or the tragedy itself with this week and refused us permission to enter the premises. One of many questions thus remaining unanswered is why Michigan Chemical ever made PBB in the first place. For in 1971, DuPont, the biggest American chemical company, rejected a similar compound on safety grounds. DuPont scientists found that this group of chemicals causes liver enlargement at low chronic doses, concentrates and remains in fat, and has low oral, skin absorption and inhalation safety factors in use. Yet at the same time, in sales literature headed Michigan Masters of Flame Retardant Chemistry, Michigan Chemical claimed their product was safe. Over 5,000 tons of Firemaster have been shipped worldwide as harmless and used in household goods, yet the raw product diluted a million times wrought damage like this. A Michigan Assistant Attorney General describes conditions in the factory. Appalling. There appears to have been a, a total lack of, of comprehension of how dangerous some of these things were uh, around the loading areas, for example, uh, where trucks were loaded. PBB and other things are, are found in the soils, which indicates that things were being slopped around, spilled, lost. But these are dangerous chemicals. I can tell you that it was necessary for the state to require the company to remove uh, the dirt down to a depth of 18 inches in the area of the loading dock. It was that contaminated. And then to safely dispose of that at a place uh, designated by state geologists. Uh, there are other examples from all over the plant. And of course, the fact that the whole network of pipes is contaminated with PBB. Our information is that levels of PBB around the 2,000 parts per million level have been discovered in the area of the loading docks. Do you have any figures That's on That's my understanding, too. I've heard the same thing. That's figure. correct. Yes. How does it get to be like this? Well, I think you have to understand that the regulatory agencies have been very, very lax in the enforcement of these laws. Uh, the chemical companies, some of them, have shown an appalling lack of social responsibility. That's a bad combination, those two. That's the combination we've had in this state. It was a particularly bad combination for men like Ron Evitz, a line worker at Michigan Chemical, handling PBB. What kind of uh, instruction did you get on handling it? Well, if we were going to handle it in great detail, to wear rubber gloves, and that was about it. If it was too dusty, they furnished us a respirator. Now we could wear if we felt it was too dusty. It's more or less up to our own judgment to when to wear it and when not to. Mm -hmm. did, did anybody explain to you that, uh, that it was dangerous or give you any indication of uh, how you know, it's safe to work with this stuff? Well, they said it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hurt you and you, know, you could eat it and it still wouldn't affect you or anything like this. They you said know. you could eat it? Yeah. And, but 
they didn't say, you know, come right out and say exactly how much, but he said it was relatively safe, you know. There's one state agency charged with protecting the health of the workers. There's another charge with protecting the river. There's another charge with protecting the air. Uh, Where were they? They were there. They were on, on premises. I, I can't tell you uh, why they didn't identify it. All I can tell you is that, that our first knowledge came from newspaper accounts. Our first direct knowledge that there was a problem. Uh, in, in my own mind, I'm convinced that if somebody had come to me early enough, I would have found a legal way to do something. Uh, some kind of court proceeding uh, to close the plant down, to, to, to stop the distribution of the cattle feed, to uh, uh, condemn the herds at an early date. I don't know what. Uh, it's hard to say. But I'm convinced in my own mind, frankly, we could have done something if we'd known. So much for Michigan Chemical. But what happened when the fire master instead of Nutrimaster was sent to the Farm Bureau feed mill? Apparently, the fire master sat there for three months before being mixed into the cattle feed. Two Farm Bureau employees noticed a different name on the sacks. One, George Saluga, has testified that when he reported to the plant manager that the sacks weren't Nutrimaster, he was told it's the same thing as the Nutrimaster, put it together on one side, inventory them as one. Farm Bureau, through its links with the Michigan Agriculture Commission, was neatly placed to protect its interests after the disaster. All five commissioners are present or past Farm Bureau members, and it is they who have to approve any lowering by the state of the PBB tolerance level. And since lowering the level means paying more compensation, Farm Bureau also hired lobbyists to work on state legislators. In the last two years, two attempts to lower the tolerance levels have failed. Prior to the second attempt, Elton Smith, Farm Bureau President, circularized his statewide membership. Act today. Contact Director B. Dale Ball and members of the Agriculture Commission. Urge them not to yield to political pressure. Cynical to the last. In fact, of course, the political pressure was coming from Farm Bureau itself. But over the last two years, an increasingly angry public has applied counter-pressure through demonstrations against state inertia. At one point, farmers trucked sick cattle to the state capitol building in Lansing and literally dumped them on the doorstep of the Republican state governor, William Milliken, who now freely admits that the situation has never been under control. Well, I don't think it's under anyone's control in the sense that uh, we presume that the... Uh, illnesses reported by farm families uh, is related to PBB. We are not going to know based upon the scientific uh, information available to us uh, really what the long-term results are for another 10 years, 25 years, 50 years, maybe 100 years. In short, uh, it's conceivable that we can be living with this problem for many generations to come. What do you say to the criticism that the whole thrust of the effort of your various agencies, Department of Agriculture and Department of Public Health, has been to try and foist on people the idea that PBB is not responsible for the bulk of the ailments for which they are of which they are complaining? The Department of Public Health has taken the position that there are PBB-related illnesses. They don't know the dimensions of it. They do fully acknowledge it, and they... Uh, going back to 1974, have been actively involved in the field in testing and in working with people. But they only they began testing effect. mother's milk in late 76. Pardon? They only began testing breast milk from mothers That's in correct, late but 76. That's correct, but they were testing in many other directions. The physical uh, uh, ailments of individuals. For a long time, Milliken's position as Michigan's chief executive has been uneasy. For the first two years of the PBB disaster, he followed the line of his agriculture and public health departments that there was no serious public health problem. But in 1976, public pressure forced him to appoint an expert panel to re-examine the PBB tolerance level. I have charged this panel to review all of the available data all of the knowledge, background, information to receive all of the comments from authorities in the field and to uh, come back with a report on the various levels which are uh, being discussed uh, in the state and outside the state. Within weeks, the panel urged the lowering of the tolerance to the smallest amount that instruments could measure. 
But it was only a recommendation. The State Agriculture Commission, appointed by the governor, which by law must approve such a change, ignored the experts. They came up, as you know, with their report recommending a very substantial reduction in the tolerance levels. My one great regret is that uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, the, the commission uh, of the department and the director of the department did not, uh, in action subsequently take, uh, taken, reduce those tolerance levels. You strike me as being unhappy about that situation. Well, you've done I, nothing about it. I uh, feel that the decision made by the commission was a wrong one. The action was subject to, under law to uh, action by the commission. They could have taken it. They did not take it. I think in retrospect, and even at the time, I felt uh, that it was a serious mistake by the commission. But Milliken did nothing. His stance remained ambivalent. The governor could not govern. He was sorry, but he had no control over his own appointees, and neither did he stem the flow of half-truths from his agriculture department, designed to obscure and diminish the realities of the PBB situation. Take the critical question of the elevators where feed is mixed and stored. Over 200 of these held the key to massive secondary contamination across the state. The Agriculture Department claims that routine checks have shown no contamination. But how many elevators have been checked? You tested all the elevators in the state of Michigan. Do I understand you correctly? I didn't say that. I said there Sorry. were 12 that had a problem. That were Farm Bureau elevators that were getting their feed from Farm Bureau where the problem was. I can't honestly say whether we tested all the elevators, but I can say that the 12 that uh, had a problem are being monitored once a month, and somewhere here I have a report on the feed ingredients, and since July of 1975, they're all zeros, and they're being tested every month, non-detected at any level in the elevator since July of 75. Mm-hmm. I have figures showing that at the end of 76, Battle Creek was still contaminated. Well, not the feed. I see. You may have found some in the dust around the elevator. Somebody may have given you some figures, but as far as the feed that we tested. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'd just like to double check with you so I understand perfectly clearly. You've uh -huh. tested 12 elevators in the state of Michigan. I'm Is telling you that there were 12 where the problem was considered to be, and those we've continued to monitor. So I can assume from that that there was no problem on any of the others, can Well, I? I don't want you to assume anything, and unfortunately, a, you know, this is quite a large department, and we have a division that works on the feed, and one that works on the meat, and one that works on something else, but I talked to the assistant chief of the division that handles the feed this morning, and I said, what's the situation on elevators? And he said, of the 12 where there was a problem, we're testing them monthly. We're taking three or four samples from every one. And we haven't found anything since July of 1975 in those elevators. So I'm telling you exactly what I know. As we spoke to Ball, the news broke that his department had rigged its latest food sampling results to show that no PPB-contaminated products were reaching the marketplace. The press revealed that the only two samples showing contamination had apparently been lost. Ball had a simple answer. We told them every sample that we had found and the level we had found it, but we missed two. And when you're shuffling thousands of papers, I think uh, you can make a human error. That's what it was, no human suppression. Error. There was no suppression. I think it was a human error. And as long as you have people, you're going to have human errors. There have been recent reports, for example, of uh, the Department of Agriculture withholding information about uh, testing results of animals. Uh, I have asked the department for a report on the allegations that have been made uh, publicly. I have received a temporary or a, an interim report. I'm frankly not satisfied with it. Satisfied or not, Milliken has yet to take decisive action. It's this pattern of cover-up and inertia that aroused the suspicions of Don L. Boster, a former member of the Michigan House of Representatives, who last year set up a special committee to probe the Department of Agriculture. Right from the start, everything that they did, uh, uh, they tried to prove it was something other than 
than uh, PBB that was causing these problems. Uh, the university was in on it, uh, the Michigan Department of Public uh, Agriculture was in it, the Michigan Department of Public Health was in on it. Uh, it seemed like right from the word go that uh, it was pretty well covered up. Albosta began by inviting anyone interested to attend public hearings. Hundreds turned up with harrowing personal terms. This whole PB mess. This isn't PBB, this is Cattlegate. Mr. Cole, Mr. Reasoner, and the rest of these crooks ought to go to jail. Because right here is the sheet that I told you that I have proofs. The same cows that they tested 10 days before were completely cured of PBB, but they're dead. But suddenly the committee's cash was cut off by the state legislature. So Al Boston never did investigate the agriculture department. I would have hired investigators that would have had the power to have gone and pulled all the records, the bank records of all these people, uh, seen if there was any large amounts put into their checking accounts, or their savings accounts, any time. Uh, but it takes investigative people to do that, and the legislator himself doesn't have the time to do that. Maybe somebody did uh, take bribes, I don't know. I've always probably kind of suspected that somebody did get uh, something out of it. Somebody got it. paid off somewhere. I've always uh, thought that, yes. I would, I just assumed, always, always assumed that that's the only way that they could take those positions. I don't see how anyone in the right mind uh, could want to poison people all over this state knowing what the effects are. Al Boster's report is still unfinished, but he hasn't given up. He's passed his files to the Michigan Attorney General. In the meantime, PBB runs its poisonous course. These deformed calves are the second generation offspring of low-level PBB cows, still classified as healthy animals. Doc Clark has kept them deep frozen as evidence that the problem will just not go away. We go back here and we had a, had a spinal column problem. Mm -hmm. Then, as we, as we come around, the, we, we see that the legs, uh, especially this leg, is all out of shape. This one probably is normal. And as we spin this calf, we can see that the one on the right is somewhat normal. This calf's leg is bent way to the back, along with the fact that it doesn't only have half of a tail. It looks like it's a dark tail. So if you take the legs, the limbs, the tail, this limb here, the problem in the spinal column, and you've got a calf that's pretty deformed. Okay, what about this little one? John, this one here comes from a low-level herd of contamination. I think the highest animal on the herd was 0.2. I did not test the mother on this one. This so when you say 0.2, that means that uh, they could have been sold, yes? Yes, they could have. 0.2 parts per million. This calf has a hydroencephaly. What is that exactly? Well, the, the shell of the skull opens up. This is froze, but when this calf was come in, you could just take its, your finger and push it right down in there. It was just like fluid in there. Hydro refers to water. Cephaly is a water head. Is there any requirement to, to let the authorities know about this kind of thing? Uh, in increased occurrence of it? No, I don't think so. I, they haven't asked. I don't think they want to know about it. And I think if I did tell them that, they'd probably laugh and say it was caused by something else. So why should I waste my time? So why are you keeping them? Well, I'm keeping these to go to court. This one here especially. And, and if we can preserve them well enough, we're going to take them in the courtroom and let the jury see them. I think the jury uh, should see them. Yeah. Because each one of the jurists has got PB in them, if they come from this area. And each one of the jurors, grandkids, great grandkids, they have this capability. Uh, they have the this capability of getting these. Juries, courts, lawsuits. Almost four years on, as officially healthy cows deliver offspring like this, the PBB tragedy generates fear for human health, anger, bitterness, and disgust. I think the word that best describes the state agency's actions is. Ah, gracious, I can't even think of a word to describe it. it they, they screwed up right from day one, as far as I'm concerned. I feel hurt more than bitter, Adam, that 
the attitude they took and didn't listen to anybody with problems. And you're paying taxes for those people to tell you the truth, and then they turn around and tell you something like this. I, I couldn't believe it. I was amazed when, when that the, right in our own state, that they were pulling the wool over the farmer's eyes. And I still think it's going on right today. There's still some farmers believe that there isn't a bit of cover up I mean, they'd trust them with their life up there, but I wouldn't trust them with a nickel. They treat them like third-rate citizens. That's what the official attitude was, and it still is. They're a bunch of dumb farmers. Well, let me tell you something. Those people have got way more on the ball than any bureaucrat in Lansing, and all those bureaucrats are feeding on these poor people like jackals on society. They run around, pat themselves on the back, tell themselves they're doing a good job. These farmers are so much better off than them people that they, they shouldn't even, these farmers, they can't even look to these farmers. They're a bunch of assholes. These people are honest people. 